Sasquatch is by far one of the most enduring mysteries of our time. In numerous cultures and legends, it's depicted as a large, hairy, ape-like creature that roams the wilderness, leaving behind footprints and tantalizing eyewitness accounts. Tales of encounters with this creature have been passed down through generations, captivating both skeptics and believers alike. What sets Sasquatch apart from other mythical creatures is the sheer breadth and depth of evidence that surrounds its existence. From the Pacific Northwest of the United States to the snowy slopes of the Himalayas, reports of Sasquatch-like creatures span the globe, transcending cultural boundaries and captivating individuals from all walks of life. Scientists and researchers have dedicated their lives to studying this phenomenon, delving into the countless reports, analyzing footprints, and using cutting-edge technology to capture potential audio and visual evidence. The allure of Sasquatch lies not only in its physical presence, but also in the profound impact it has on human culture. Throughout history, indigenous tribes and Native American communities have shared rich oral traditions which include tales of these wild and mysterious creatures. From the fierce yet wise guardian of the forest to a symbol of untamed wilderness, Sasquatch holds a significant place in folklore, art, and storytelling. But what compels us to explore the mystery of Sasquatch? Is it a quest for scientific validation? Is it a deep-rooted desire to challenge the boundaries of our understanding of the natural world? Or perhaps is it a longing for a connection with something greater than ourselves, a primal instinct to seek out the unknown? Regardless of our individual motivations, studying Sasquatch offers a unique opportunity to bridge the gap between science and folklore, to explore the boundaries of what is known and what remains undiscovered. It requires an open mind, a willingness to question conventional wisdom, and a sense of adventure to delve into the depths of the unknown. So I can tell you a little bit too about uh, my personal experience um, that kind of kicked off my interest in the subject matter. So um, I don't, and I should lead into that too just by stating I never had like a, a really serious interest in Bigfoot or Sasquatch uh, or anything like that prior to this happening. I thought it was kind of like a, a novel idea. There's like, oh, there's like maybe this undiscovered thing out there in the woods or whatever. Oh, well, it's not my problem. I'm probably never even gonna run into it. Um, and then back in 2017, uh, I'd gone on a fishing trip uh, with a friend. And uh, what had happened uh, was we went to bed fairly early that night and um, in the, uh, I, and I'd been sleeping uh, in a single, single man shelter too. So it's made of like looser material rather than like a, a tent where you're sleeping in the middle. And if something were to, you know, poke or prod at your tent, it's just really touching like the, the tautness or the tightness of the, of the material. And it's not really getting through. This is like a, it's loose and you can, you could actually grab and feel things. So that's the type of uh, tent or uh, sleeping system I was using. And uh, I was also uh, probably set seven or eight meters away from my friend's tent um, as well. And um, at some point in the middle of the night, in the pitch black, if I were to guess, I'm, I'm guessing this would have been maybe like 3.30 um, in the morning, 3, 3.30 in the morning, still pitch black. Uh, something had come into our campsite uh, and it was standing over my head and uh, it had reached through the looseness of the material and it grabbed my head um, with a grip. So this isn't like a, a poke prod of a paw, this is splayed fingers through the material, grabbed my head, woke me up, I panicked uh, and I kind of jostled forward a little bit and then the hand retreated. And then it's just silence. And I don't know, maybe five, 10, 15 seconds had gone by. by um, this is where I get confused because this is at, like after a period of time, like, like these, period, these periods of time in this kind of like, uh, just like freshly woken state are very difficult to, to judge after the, after the event. 
the hand uh, came back through the tent or the, the my bivy shelter and grabbed my head again and then it felt around my head left and right a couple of times like this and so you have to also imagine like if you've ever seen on television LeBron James grab a basketball it looks like a normal person when they grab a grapefruit right the fingers go all the way around, all the way around it right and that's what was happening to me too so I could feel the fingers on the front of my face and fingers all the way around my head but there was fabric between but there's still like loose like the tent material too so something is grabbing me with a grip through my tent what, what I, I I've said this before one of the things that it reminds me of is um, it reminds me of like if you put your hand if you were to put your hand into a backpack and you're like looking for like a can of soup or you're looking for a fork or whatever when you're camping you're just you're going through everything and you're trying to find you're trying to figure out what everything is by touch that's what this reminds me of it wasn't violent uh, or uh, or aggressive in a, in a way of, like it was trying to hurt me it was like huh, what is this this is weird um, and so this is happening to me with these impossibly large hands the big like the biggest hands and I can't see it, but I can feel it. And it's dark out, and now this thing has essentially collapsed my tent system on my face as it's feeling around my face. How long did that happen for? Um, for me, it felt like a really long time, uh, but it probably was only for what? Seven, eight, nine, ten seconds? Uh, and then um, I had gotten tired of that, so I pulled my head forward. Uh, and because I can't sit up, I can't stand, and I was didn't think screaming was going to help me. Um, so I sat up kind of violently, and then the hand retreated again. And then after that, silence. So I didn't after that I didn't hear anything move off. Nothing poked or poked or prodded my tent anymore or my uh, shelter, and I didn't hear anything lumber off. So I just sat there in this thing where now my all the material is collapsed on my face and I'm just sitting there, or lying there I guess, trying to be as quiet as possible, trying to play dead. And uh, yeah, until, until the sun came up, I had essentially just had to lie there and not know what I was going to do. So in this shelter too, right, there's no, I don't have any firearms, I don't have any knives, I don't even have any bear spray. Um, I had my keys in my hand. That was it. That's all I had to like defend myself. If something was trying to unbutton this, like a uh, and like eat me, like a uh, like it's un undressing a banana or something like that. So when you were lying there waiting, you didn't hear it walk off. So it Nothing. could have just been standing there watching you for a yeah. long time. Yeah, over top, leaning over top of the thing, right? And it's it's all that hard pack kind of Alberta, you know run-of-the-mill terrain where it's just, you should have heard, I should have heard something crunch, crunch, crunch as it moved off or, or something, but nothing like that happened, which is, which is, was even more unnerving. So it's just, there's, you hear a little bit of wind, you hear a little bit of like, maybe a little bit of water from like a nearby creek or something like that, but that was it. Z zero movement. So as far as I knew, it was still there. So, um, I wasn't going back to sleep and I sure wasn't comfortable. Um, and I was, yeah, it was, it was, it was probably one of the most miserable nights I'd ever had camping because whatever this is, is still to me the whole time was, was there. So eventually though, the sun came up and, um, uh, I actually think I, I eventually did get out once the sun had come up because I can see around me now and I can see that there's nothing else silhouetted around the shelter or whatever. And after however many minutes I was pretty certain whatever was gone anyways and um, yeah so I got up went to the bathroom and I actually kind of just lied back down again and then shortly after that like my friend got up too and uh, still pretty early in the morning still pretty cold out and uh, the first thing that he said to me was what were you doing walking around my tent all last night Jungle. So he'd taken his tent and he pushed it further back into the, into the bush. So he had knee-high scrub and brush and debris and crap like that all around his all around his tent. So something had been behind his tent walking around it as well through all of that 
brush and de debris and stuff. I didn't ask him too much about it, but I kind of just said, yeah, I think something came through the campsite last night. And so this is the other part too, is like, well, were there other people there? No, we were camping, camping on Crown land in the middle of nowhere on a Thursday night. So there, we had no neighbors or anything like that. Um, within kilometers, within kilometers, no neighbors. We had also left hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars worth of like fishing gear and electronics and all like nice camping stuff around our campsite tonight too. Nothing was stolen. So we don't think it was prowlers. Plus, I like to think that if some, like if somebody was prowling around the campsite and was stealing our valuables, they're probably not going to be touching us through the tent or stuff like that. Also, I should mention, well, because uh, someone's gonna ask, well, do you think it was like your friend screwing around with you? Well, for one, he would have laughed afterwards. And that's a whole other thing. But the other part is that he has sleep apnea. So while this encounter was happening and then immediately following, I could hear him snoring because he, he was snoring violently without his CPAP. And uh, yeah, so that's how I know it wasn't him. Well, do you think it was a bear or something like that? I guess that's possible too. There, there, I, I had never seen a black bear there until several years after that, um, but that's possible. But whatever grabbed me, he also had hands, impossibly large hands. Go take, the, go take a look under your kitchen and find the largest frying pan you have and that's how big the hand was. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Whatever grabbed me had fingers. So while it was happening, while his hand was on your face, there wasn't any point where you were like, there's a bear here. You were probably thinking in your gut it was something. I'm just, oh no, at the time I'm like, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dying. This is how I, this is how I die. This is how I die. But I never saw anything, so I never went to bear or prank or prowler or anything like that. My mind was just like death. So you didn't think Bigfoot at all? <laughs> no, not at the time. Um, and so uh, this uh, this made life really uncomfortable for me. I didn't go camping or fishing or anything like that overnight uh, again for the rest of that summer. So. Um, by the end of the, closer to the end of the summer though, I'd come to this conclusion, like maybe what happened is actually Bigfoot. So this is where like my, um, I don't know, my interest in things kind of kick off because, because that for me, that wasn't an, an impossibility. I guess that was in the, the realm of, um, unlikely, unlikely things that could happen maybe. Um, I ended up going to a Bigfoot conference in, uh, at the end of, August or even into, well into September, I think it was. Um, so 2017 was coincidentally the 50 year anniversary of the Patterson Gimlin film being uh, shot. And Bob Gimlin and was at um, was at in in Mon Western Montana at a conference. And I went, so I wanted, but that wasn't the reason I was going down there. I went down there because. I wanted to ask people some questions, and at this point I hadn't discovered the Alberta Sasquatch website or met Rob or anyone like that. So, because now this is within my realm of, of the realm of possibility of things that have happened, if not a likely culprit for, for that. If it's real, then maybe that's what happened. Um, anyway, so I go down to this Bigfoot conference, and because uh, I, I, in a way, I, th there was a part of me that just wanted to see, like, Okay, everyone that comes here is going to be just like some redneck, hillbilly, hick, and they're all going to have ridiculous stories. And then I will know from their, their ridiculousness and their lack of credibility that what happened to me couldn't have been this. So, it could, so by it being not that thing, it could, then it, could, it becomes more, I was able to go back to more sensible, more reasonable, more practical more likely um, explanations. And so, anyways, I went down there and that wasn't my experience. The, I met, there was a lot of people there uh, who were just regular everyday people. And at some point in their regular everyday activities, usually camping, hiking, hunting, whatever, they ran into them. But this is the, where the, cra this is the craziest part. So I went down there and then on the Friday night, uh, they were running one of those town hall style encounter kind of, tell us your story kind of nights. And I showed up a little bit late actually, I'd missed the first hour or two. And so I go and I sneak in quietly to the back and I sit down at the back and someone is talking, kind of giving their story. I didn't really catch the beginning of it. And then they kind of sit down. 
And they're like, all right, anyone else have a story? And so they give this the microphone over to this gentleman from Idaho. And he's like, yep, I've had an encounter. Uh, it scared the poop out of me. He says, I was camping with my wife in northern Idaho. And he said that uh, because he was so tall, uh, and the tent that they had at the time wasn't actually big enough. So they actually slept with the door half open. So just like the flap was out so he could sleep with his feet outside the door. So the door was already like easy to get through open and get out in the tent too. In the middle of the night, they had something crunch, 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 crunch come up to the tent and had put pushed its hand through the material and grabbed his head or yeah, touched his head, not grabbed. And he's like, oh my goodness, something's happening. So he, unlike me, grabs a giant firearm and a flashlight, throws open the door, jumps out, spins around, turns on the flashlight and points the gun at, at, in the direction where he got poked at. And uh, he sees this giant Sasquatch and, makes, and it makes the classic, ooh, like pursed lips, ooh, uh, sound, turns around, runs back through the bush, and he's dumbstruck by the fact that he just saw a Bigfoot. Try to, and it, whatever that Bigfoot was, had grabbed his head through the tent. And here I am, I've driven six and a half hours to Montana to be like, partly amused and partly like, I don't know, whatever. And I sit down late for this town hall thing. And the first person that stands up basically describes that the same thing that happened to me happened to him, but he was able to confirm what it was by getting up, shining a flashlight on it. So here I am and I'm like, is this real? Is this real life? <laughs> this, is, this is ridiculous. The first person to stand up and tell their story at this thing is describing what happened to me. Yeah, so I went to I went there to kind of like disprove it and to be able to laugh about it and be like, ah, oh, this is all BS. Uh, and then in the end, I like walk away. I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is, is this, is this happening? Is this my life? I'll be one of those guys that's seen aliens or UFOs or ghosts or whatever. And now I'm like, I'm in that world, it feels like. So anyways, so then uh, uh, after that, uh, I was able to kind of, kind of, come back down and then kind of d begin reading into the biological reality of what we're, what we're describing here. And as it turns out, there's actually a fair bit, uh, a fair bit of wealth around the, or a fair bit of information, a wealth of information uh, and a wealth of evidence, credible evidence uh, towards a biological reality for, for this. This is the first year where anyone has submitted to us anything um, that we could credibly call <laughs> uh, physical evidence. Uh, certainly um, having that submitted by a, a credible third party is pretty cool. Um, so the story behind this hair here that was sent in to us was, uh, uh, it was sent in from uh, an indigenous First Nations elk hunter, a young uh, gentleman. Uh, out living uh, on the Bighorn Reservation near Abraham Lake and um, apparently there had been uh, a flurry of audio activity or sorry audible activity so vocalizations and things like that this year in particular uh, that really made this summer stand out and that aside uh, he'd gone out uh, one particular day kind of investigating and poking around in an area where a lot of this audible activity was coming from uh, and through that, he ended up finding a fairly fresh looking tree break uh, at a somewhat elevated level, but still within uh, reasonable, you know, reasonable uh, height off the, off the tree itself. Um, something a person, I suppose, could potentially do. Although uh, it would take a fair bit of strength to, to create the snap. And anyways, off of this tree break looking thing, or 
this broken tree, I should say, he ended up finding uh, a series, like a tuft of hair that had been rubbed off, and it had been from closer to the top point too, where something you know, grabbed this, snapped it off too. And in that area um, was this uh, was a number of different hairs which he had harvested and collected and provided to uh, to us to be able to to take a look at. So we're looking forward to being able to do that. Maybe, maybe be able to run a little bit of a preliminary analysis to see if we can rule out any kind of known species uh, or to see if these hairs have any characteristics of a, a known animal. So if we could do that, then it goes into the low probability but not zero probability category and then we put it off to the side. What can you do using a two hair to, like without actually doing DNA analysis to tell what it is? So there's going to be a couple of things that we can look for. So the first thing we're going to look for is the presence or absence of a medulla that runs through uh, the length of each of the strands. If they're if it's absent, that moves it into a, like a slightly higher probability uh, category. Beyond that, I'm not a hair expert, and I don't know if I would be able to rule anything out. But if we do get a, a, a computer. Uh, uh, a style of micro or a microphone, a style of a microscope uh, where we can generate high resolution imagery from these. We could also uh, that also opens up the the possibilities where we can send this to a number of uh, our contacts in the United States so that they can give a second opinion to uh, to figure out whether or not this has any promise. What um, do you think about tree breaks and tree structures because those are found in Alberta? Those are another. Um, those are another one that I would chalk up to, and eh? <laughs> I don't know. Um, to me, there it's like uh, there, there's some pretty promising. There might be some promising things there too, right? There's this. Uh, I I I still believe that if there if there is a biological creature running around through the woods, uh, that it will from time to time manipulate its environment, uh, either uh, to do things like uh, create markers, uh, uh, display sort of signs or display uh, warnings, uh, territorial markers, waypoints for navigation, um, or even just something like to, you would, th I would think, to, you know, just even like snap a branch off to indicate the direction of water uh, or safe travel or something like that too. You would, you would expect a biological creature with a significant level of intelligence to be able to create manipulations. Um, and it's, I suppose it's entirely possible as well uh, that something might display that sort of human-like capacity to either create something that would, I guess we would call art or uh, like a creation, just something something for the sake of expression. And maybe that's possible too as well. So I don't know, if I was running around naked in the woods all day as well, I'd probably get bored and try to do the, the forest equivalent of building a sandcastle, which to me would be arranging uh, arranging uh, the furniture of the woods, the, the, the deadfall and the trees into some sort of ordered pattern. Maybe that's what we're looking at, if that's a real thing. Um, for me, 50-50. So field research takes on a couple of different uh, initiatives, everything from uh, sitting out long-term audio projects. We have uh, audio recording systems that are able to record for three, four, five weeks at a time, continuously or through programmed periods of time. We typically run them uh, in the evenings and then we bring that back for analysis at home. We've also set up camera traps, camera trap arrays in uh, areas with historical encounter, uh, historical accounts, uh, encounters, uh, sightings. Uh, when we go out as well, we do have some, uh, we do have some um, initiatives at night too, where we're out with night optics, thermal imaging systems, um, uh, or even like a little parabolic listening system so that we can listen for activity. And every year uh, it evolves a little bit. We are able to try new things, as, especially as we meet new people with new skills. Um, uh, as an example, this year was one of the first years that we, we had a successive successive generations of call blasting equipment where we tried different setups and we uh, would test to see what kind of results we could get from that. So yeah, uh, it's it's been pretty interesting. We had gone out uh, with our call blasting system. We'd taken it out on a side-by-side -side with some other quads uh, in support and we'd taken it out about 2.4 kilometers from our campsite. 
And what I decided, or what we had decided we wanted to do was to create what was called an audio breadcrumb trail. So we would go out, do some call blasting from one particular area, the furthest distance we could get from the camp. Um, and then we would listen, wait 10, 20, 30 minutes, pack it up, come back about a kilometer, stop for a while, let things settle, blast, listen, pack up and come back. So while we were doing that, trying to create a, an audio trail back to our campsite, just as we were coming back into the campsite, we actually had left three individuals there, uh, two males and one female uh, members of the group. What happened was we, uh, as we were coming back, as the quads were just coming to within visual range of the camp, uh, they had a large stone um, come in horizontally th through the camp and it landed near the wood pile. There were two dogs there as well, uh, a mastiff and a husky, which immediately alerted and pointed in the, di in the direction, uh, in a particular direction in the woods. So this rock was very noticeable and it spooked the, the three occupants of the camp that were minding the fire. Um, I don't remember if we had made a conscious decision to not pursue or look for the source of where this came from uh, at the time, but the following morning, it was the first time that we actually kind of went to go look in the direction from where this rock had been thrown. And what we ended up finding were actual barefoot human-like footprints in the mud. Um, and that was unreal for us because uh, the substrate here in Alberta is always hard pack, uh, rock, like it's almost kind of got that Canadian shield kind of feel to it, right? Or it's covered in moss, leaf litter, needle litter, and nothing received nothing nothing receives prints in this entire province. But on the on the night before we got there, it rained, uh, and then we had beautiful clear weather every other day. And so as this unknown figure threw a rock and ran away, uh, it had to jump a creek. And as it jumped the creek, it's either its right or its left foot, I can't remember now, struck the edge of the bank and its foot contoured to the edge of the bank. And then its, its uh, five toes landed and made impressions in the mud. And then you could see the left, right, left, right as it ran away subsequently uh, in this trackway. Uh, so we only could see the first four or five, but the one that struck the edge of the bank when we get your, when we got our faces up close and up close to it, it's about it's a barefoot human footprint. Uh, it's about the same size as a size 13 men's boot, and you can count all five toes. And we were just dumbstruck that uh, something had essentially come into the campsite within 10 meters of our campfire, uh, and then as our quads were coming back, it had decided to throw a rock, maybe as a decoy or maybe something else and then to turn around and run uh, uh, directly into the woods in pitch black. And not only that, but the route that it took to the to and from the campsite was through uh, knee-high scrub and brush uh, and debris and stuff like that. So if me or you were looking for a spot to go across this creek, where this figure went through, either uh, on its, certainly on its way out, but probably on its way uh, in as well, was not what we would choose. It's, it was um, suboptimal, I think, would be the best way to put it. And so that was particularly surprising. And so that was the most eventful thing that we had, um, I think, in, in the field this year. But we've investigated uh, private property, we've been out on public land, um, and we've had a, a, a number of other anomalous things happen to us. In Alberta, here are these areas that we go to to investigate. What kind of like specific, I guess, environments do you think they're hiding out in? Like caves or like what? Where do you think they are? Yeah, so we have like karst regions too that are uh, that are uh, suitable for for developing caves and stuff like that. You'd have to assume that they'd kind of be like a troglodyte, right? They'd be a, qu a cave dweller. Um, yeah. It's but it's it's yeah it's it's interesting though because the other there's another part of it though where it's like their curiosity seems to bring them right to the fringes of our civilization and so and they seem to operate nearly with impunity right on the edges of continuous human habitation occupation which is wild.
do you think uh, Sasquatch is? What, are, what is your top theory at this point? <laughs> um, I'm not even sure if I care anymore. It's just, it just is. And I know this, this is, would be an, this could be an important question. And I think uh, what you think it is influences your, um, it influences your methodology, right? If you're, if you're out trying to actively look for this or pursue this question, I think that influences it. So if you, um, for one though, I, uh, I'll start with what I, what I think I know, which is that there is a biological reality to it. So there, there is a physical, tangible creature of some kind. Um, obviously there's quite, there's probably a community of them or a network of them uh, and a breeding population of them, if, if that's real. Like I said though, I've never, I've never seen one. And I can't tell you with any degree of certainty what happened to me uh, with my personal encounter was definitely, definitely one of these things. Um, beyond that, everything else is an unknown, right? Researchers like Thomas Steenberg, uh, I think his catchphrase is stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. Um, and the fact, the facts seem to be is that the, there is evidence that supports a, a biological reality. Um, and that, uh, every year I, every year I talk to new eyewitnesses who have seen them here in Alberta. Everything else after that is, is a bit of a mystery, right? So we, we, we can think of some of these, um, some of these uh, possible distant uh, relatives of humans and Neanderthals and some of them seem to be, uh, some of them within the last 10,000 years seem to be a pretty good fit for what we might be encountering. The part that bothers me um, is that we've, we've almost built them up now into like these like su super perfect, uh, infallible things, right? Where they're, they have the the super strength, and they have the the night vision, and they have the amazing smell, and the this, and this, and this. And basically, we built them up into like like comic book superheroes. Now they have all of those things apparently. And uh, what I think though is, if if we ever do catch up with this, and we ever figure out what's going on, um, we're going to be a little bit. I don't want to say disappointed. But I think we're. I think the reality of it is going to be a lot more down to earth than all of these, all of these attributes that we've we put on them. We keep stacking all of these things, and that's not to say that they're not remarkable or um, or anything like that. Uh, this is this would definitely be that uh, as you know, Doctor the late Doctor Binder Nagel described it, the zoological discovery of the century, or maybe of ever. And that's pretty. That's pretty significant. So you are a military veteran. Yeah. You have lots of training. Um, do you think there's like a military kind of tactical aspect to their behavior? I suppose so because uh, there's it, there there appears to be um, if they're if they are a real um, <laughs> biological creature, there does seem to be this this uh, this implementation of. Um, evasiveness, right? And there does appear to be group participation in that activity where um, they will use things like subversion uh, or, um, I don't want to say subversion, what's a better way to put it? They'll use distractions, right? You, a person visually witnesses one over here and now that one is in mortal danger. So another one over here will create uh, an audible uh, signal rustle some bushes, scream at you, throw a rock, or even throw a rock at you so that you look this way and then this one uh, is able to um, retreat to safety. So there's, there are things like that, but I'm sure like, I'm sure things like that also exist in nature in other ways though. So I don't know if military tactics are quite the right way to put it, but one of the things that we do see in, in reports as well, uh, the, BFRO, they have a term for it, they call it castle of voting. What, what appears to happen from our, the anecdotal evidence we have is that they seem to layer uh, obstacles between us. So they never re rely, and that's something that we would do in the military too, is you never rely on one, on one mechanism uh, to insulate you from, the, from, uh, from uh, 
being seen or discovered or being shot at. You try to put as much stuff between you and them as you can. And not just physical objects, but impassable terrain or you do things um, at night and stuff like that. So they will, the, the layered defenses they have are being predominantly active at night, where our vision is substandard. Um, they will take the high ground. They will observe you through impassable terrain. They will observe you from the far side of a river. Um, they will observe you from behind a boulder or in the prone position on their bellies. Uh, so they're not silhouetted. Um, they will observe from thick cover and not just the edge of thick cover too, where you're in the nearest trees prior to um, the thing you're observing. They will be layers back in the tree line so that they will have uh, a substantial amount of brush and debris and cover all between you and they only need to see a little piece of you to know that you're there. So it's, 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 it's there is a, an intelligence there where they are using I guess a form of tactics to layer impo impossible terrain, uh, impossible conditions, and uh, physical obstacles between you and them. After saying that, what do you think about the weird, like, almost childlike curiosity of them approaching your tent and touching you? I think you. I think something like that can can get away with that with a, with a fairly high degree of confidence. It's it was a very strange experience. But at the same time, um, we're fairly vulnerable when we're sleeping at night too, right? Um, many of us snore, and really humans have a very predictable pattern of behavior. We go camping, we light a big fire, eat a big meal, um, have a few laughs, and then we let the fire die down. We go into our tents, and when the tents go out, in our, uh, sorry, when the lights go out in our tents, we don't really emerge from there again. We're uncomfortable with the cold and the dark uh, and and the unknown. So we don't really come out of our little cocoons or whatever. And so I think they know that. And I think with a, with a degree of confidence, witnessing that same pattern of fire, eating, drinking, sleeping, uh, just over and over and over, I would feel pretty comfortable like coming up and approaching a tent at night uh, as well, especially when you could do it as quiet as whatever came up to my tent. What do you think uh, the chances are of the Bigfoot having abilities that seem to be, I guess, more supernatural? I guess that's possible. So again, too, it's, um, I guess I've never seen anything that rules that out. Um, and you know what, I guess there's witnesses out there too that have experienced some high strangeness or supernatural aspects to their encounters. I I don't know if we've really talked to a lot of people here in Alberta though, uh, where we've been able to physically meet up with witnesses, uh, uh, discuss their uh, situation, where any of those people have really outlined to us, you know, I saw it disappear, or I've, I've been seeing lights in the woods, or you know, I stepped through a portal, or it's spoken to my mind. I. I don't think we really talked to a lot of people that had that experience yet. Um, but no, I guess I'm open to that too. I guess that's that's possible. That just makes it way creepier. So if I ever, by the way, if I ever see a big footstep through a portal, that's it. I'm done. Never going camping again. Um, after your experience, are you convinced that they're actually real, or are you still on the fence? So the, 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 the part that makes this harder for me is that I never saw what grabbed me that night, twice. And, but now I've been, I've been out to some of these like private locations, some of these, uh, some of these public, some of these public locations and had more anomalous stuff happening. Uh, it, it feels like, uh, every time like my interest begins to wane or something like that, there's just enough of a breadcrumb trail that's presented to me to kind of like, ah, no, you gotta come back. You gotta, there's something to this. And so, um, without that visual setting, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'll ever be pushed completely over, 
over the top, no matter how many witnesses I talk to. And that's the hard part too, right? Is you, you talk to, uh, if you talk to half a dozen new witnesses every year who've had sightings in their lifetime, uh, where they uh, are very much convinced of what they've seen. They do not believe this is a case of misidentification. Uh, their encounters happened at close range and were very, uh, very meaningful and impactful and have actually changed their lives. You meet these people and you listen to their stories. And it, it feels, I don't want to say disingenuous, but it feels um, like I'm short selling their encounter by still saying I'm on the fence about this being real because this person who I believe is so adamant about what they've seen. And so it, it feels like I'm doing them a disservice by, by not being in all in on what they're telling me to. So uh, there's some conflicts in me there, but yeah, I guess we'll see. Do you think there's any significance behind the fact that reports are of bipedal creatures of this are coming from all corners of the earth, like the Yowie in Australia or the Yeti? Doesn't that seem... that just makes it... Uh, see, um, I don't know. I guess that makes it harder too, right? Like, um... <laughs> You know, I, you can see like these like dense forests of like Southeast Asia. You know, you have to assume that if there's this biological creature running around the woods here, that it originated there and then it came over on the land bridge, uh, however many years ago. Um, but uh, it's it bothers me that, and I don't have an explanation for this on why there would be a biological reality to a creature like this in so many different places where so many other cultures have witnessed and seen them for millennia uh, and we still out of all of these places and all of these people looking that we still haven't even stumbled into a, bo uh, a body or something like that or you know the truck driver that sm smashes one on the highway and then uh, you know on cable news they're picking its bones and guts and stuff like that in the fur out of like the grill of a, of a vehicle and you know, on, on a remote highway in Australia or, um, you know, uh, maybe on some sort of back road in Malaysia, Vietnam, or whatever the case is. So the other thing, though, is like when you when you consider the uh, the richness of the environments, the places like uh, Sumatra, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, like you, you think of the richness and the biodiversity that exists there. Um, it, that reminds me of like, yes, a creature like that could exist and remain hidden in a place like that. But then here we are in like Alberta <laughs> and we get, uh, we get credible witness sightings from an hour and a half west of Edmonton, Alberta or 30 minutes west of Calgary, right? So you have like these metropolitan built up areas, 1.3, 1.4 million people. And then just in a stone's throw away to the west, you have Bigfoot sightings <laughs> in these like see, uh, seemingly, I don't want to say desolate, but like um, in, in like boreal forest and like, uh, or even like, uh, we don't have any kind of like temperate rainforest. We have, um, was it, uh, we're, it's almost like a semi-arid kind of desert-like terrain where then on the prairies that meets up with the with the, uh, the Rockies and the and the and the forests and the trees. It bothers me that something like that that that's supposed to exist out there can pull it off here as well. Um, it's I don't know. To me it kind of supports some of the supernatural mystical elements of it. Yeah. You think I, of like a mountain gorilla it exists in one really specific area. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It was able to be found mm -hmm. in such small numbers. Yeah. Yeah, when they look for those things, or even like uh, Siberian tigers or something like that, they're like, we know they exist in this 12 mile by 12 mile square. We've seen them from the air. We can do these things hard to, that are hard to, to sneak up onto, and they're very dangerous. But, I mean, you're just as likely to get a report here from... Um, temperate rainforest in on Vancouver Island as you are in minus 40 degrees Celsius in freaking northern Alberta, which I understand adaptability, but I don't understand the reality of, of that too. And yes, there's stories of like footprints that disappear in the middle of fields or plateaus or, um, or things like that. Um, 
that yeah that, that just can't be explained and um, I think that bothers a lot of people too um, that uh, that stuff like that seems to be, that seems to happen so What do you think the best method is to go about trying to locate all these things and get a proof of like what's it gonna take to prove the, the existence of it? We're gonna have to nuke them from orbit like an aliens. <laughs> um, you know what the, I think the most novel idea was was uh, the different like the different airship projects and stuff like that. Um, the funny thing is um, the technology perhaps in a, in, like a, in a militaristic kind of way, already exists that would be needed to observe them in, a, in, a, in their natural habitat in a sustained way. But here's, a, here's a, uh, another anecdotal piece that I remember seeing, which it, it felt like a credible encounter. It was just a story of a, of a hunter that was hunting on the edge of a plateau. I can't remember if he was on the ground or in a tree stand. Anyways, he um, watched a Sasquatch uh, break the tree line and he and the Sasquatch was just kind of moseying through the field, uh, through the clear cut or whatever the heck it was, the, the meadow. Uh, and then a, a small single engine plane had, was flying over uh, the, the meadow or was just coming in. And what the Sasquatch did was it stopped, it kneeled down, it put its hands over its head and it acted like a rock while this plane was flying over. And then when the plane was gone, it stood back up and just continued on its way. It never seen the hunter the whole time. And so you have to think about like that level of intelligence of like this plane was flying over with no real intention of probably even looking for something like that, uh, most certainly. And it still took a cautionary, it took a cautionary measure to make sure that it, it didn't stand out because it knew that that was something of ours. <laughs> That's not wild. So I guess I didn't really answer your question, but the, the, the thing about it too is um, long-term deep penetration projects. You would, um, you would probably have to find an area with either a regular or sustained regular or seasonal activity. And you'd have to establish a presence there, probably habituate them to your, to your presence, um, and then perhaps you might have an encounter. So. No big deal. Just go find a piece of private property where you have 24 seven access, um, where people let you set up shop in the long term and see if you can have an encounter. Why do, or what significance would the discovery have on the world? Why do so many people dedicate so much time there? I don't even really care about the discovery. I just want a couple of answers for my own, ex for, to answer from my own experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, like the, the discovery would be change, life changing. It, it would it would have an effect within society that would be very odd. I I, I couldn't even predict the effect of um, a, another upright human like whatever living adjacent to us, un unrecognized but not unreported for however long we've been here. That's, that would be wild. I think now that we're even in the 21st century, that our, our, our like incredulousness to this, our, the, like the mind blowing effect is even amplified. Like if, you know, the Patty would have stepped out of the woods in 1967, you know, in Bluff Creek, California, and then all, you know, all of the people were, were rounding up the horses and the posse and we're going out there. And if they were to have like brought one back in, in 68 or 69, I think they would have been, those people would have been better prepared for like for this, right? They got they went out, they got it on film, and then they went out and they got a they uh, took one in the woods, they shot it, or whatever the case is. I think that would have been a very like neat and tidy end to it, and we would be living in a slightly different world now. But now we're like now it's like the 21st century. Everyone and we have all of these other well, why don't we? Right? The why don't we have? Or why don't we have better footage? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have whatever? And so the, the more the why don't we? Or the or shouldn't we have the, the the shouldn't we haves? The more those add up, um, I think the the bigger the the effect would be. The more 
dumbfounded people would be that stuff like that could still exist. When you go camping now, every time you go out, do you think of a Bigfoot? Or is it just, are you, able, are you able to go on like a regular camping trip or are you always like looking around? Mm, so when I go fishing, I mostly just care about fishing now. That was really hard to do for the first few years. So. I just, I, I just couldn't get comfortable. Like you're, you're uh, other than standing in the middle of a river, whipping a little fly around on a fly rod. Where else are you uh, like that vulnerable? The only other place that I could think of that you're like, kind of like, you have that same feeling of vulnerability is like when you're in the shower and you got soap in your hair. And you're, you're like, this is how the, the, the guy dies or the woman dies in Psycho, right? <laughs> you're like, you got nowhere to go and, Anyways, but no, it's a, like fishing or camping and stuff like that. It's a pretty vulnerable thing though, too, because you're 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 kind of you're going back out to the the wild place to be to be kind of like part of the wild world for a bit, and with that comes a degree of vulnerability. And I couldn't really manage that very well for the first couple of years. Now I kind of can, but it's even more uncomfortable when you're out actually looking for something to happen too, because. In that last 10 minutes before you actually close your eyes and go to sleep, you're like, oh, God, I hope nothing happens tonight. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. So, yeah. Are you going to keep looking for it for the rest of your life? Probably not. I think, I it's, for me, it's like buying a lottery ticket, right? You can go out a few times. There doesn't seem to be much you can do to induce, uh, induce activity, if anything. Probably, for all we know, every time we, we take some sort of active measures, an active step to actively... <laughs> Um, try to bring attention to ourselves. We're probably just putting things off. Um, and uh, I don't know. So you, uh, the cool thing about this though is you can combine it with camping. So if you can keep meeting good people uh, that you like to spend time with, who can go out, uh, and you and you do that sort of camping with a purpose, uh, I think that's sustainable. Uh, and so, what does big footing look like? Just keeping an eye out for things when you're doing those activities that you love anyways. You can increase your odds by going to some of these places with histories of sightings, geographic clusters of sightings, recent sightings, talking to witnesses. But the part that I enjoy the most though is the, the being the biographer of the story or being like the, almost like a folklorist, right? Where I'm collecting all of these stories. I'm vetting them and then I'm making them available publicly for free for anyone who wants them. Uh, and that tells the story of Sasquatch in Alberta. That's the most important part for me is, is sustaining this body of knowledge and information and adding to it, contributing a little bit, and then passing it on to the next person when all of this shit is still a mystery. I'm freaking dead. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, so no, it's uh there has to be like a limit to, to what you put yourself through. Um, there's a lot of people that have thrown themselves at this. They've thrown their whole lives at this and then they didn't really, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird little thing where just as you're, your interest is beginning to wane from a lack of new, new reports or new physical evidence or new whatever, there's just some little tiny breadcrumb that is thrown to you that says, eh, keep looking. 